I'm Rachel and this is my AM reading video for Friday, January 22nd, 2021, on a Saturday. <laughs> uh, though it does feel like with this week I should continue to extend a little grace to myself perhaps. Uh, <laughs> it's been kind of a crazy week. And there is a cat right here <laughs> on, on the uh, desk where I am filming. So anyway, <laughs> we're just going to hammer on here. Uh, this week uh, was crazy in part because I usually work on Capitol Hill in D.C., but uh, thanks to the insurrection from a couple of weeks ago and the inauguration earlier this week, um, I wasn't allowed to come into work. I thought erroneously that I was allowed to come back today on Friday. Uh, but, you know, as I was entering into the Capitol complex, I uh, kind of re was realizing slowly something is not right here. You know, if anything, there's more National Guard, there's more barricades, there's more barbed wire. And once I got into my building, I could see it was very much a staging area only for the National Guard. <laughs> I saw next to no one else in that building. Luckily, uh, everyone was very kind to me. Uh, Given the situation, I guess, uh, I didn't look like a threat to national security. <laughs> uh, I just basically confirmed with my work email that I wasn't supposed to be there. <laughs> so there's that. And then uh, next week, it seems like uh, I'm continuing to be on furlough, basically, uh, for a while as uh, things are de-escalating in the capital and they're not wanting to bring, you know, non-essential people back too quickly, I guess. So there's that. <laughs> I did get a little bit of reading done in the interim of this new furlough, starting with this book, uh, Fields of Exile by Nora Gold. This is a Jewish fiction book I've had on my Goodreads uh, TBR for several years. It was near the top of the list. I have a lot of feelings about this book. It touches upon issues that uh, uh, are very personal to me. Uh, it takes place in Canada, actually, uh, in 2002-2003, where we are following um, this young woman, 30-something young woman, Judith, around. She had been living for 10 years in Israel, like shortly after uh, leaving college, and then she comes back to Canada, where she was raised, as her father is dying, and she takes care of him for a while in his final months, and then she acquiesces to his final wish, which is for her to get a... Uh, graduate degree and basically start her life as it were because in Israel it seems like she was kind of flitting around from job to job mostly to do with social work though and so she decides to take a social work uh, degree at a fictional Canadian university uh, so we're following her through that uh, the back cover copy made it sound like uh, the inciting incident would be that uh, there was a uh, pro-Palestinian uh, terrorist supporting uh, keynote speaker in a, of an event that would sort of catapult events in this uh, novel, but that's not really the way it necessarily went. It was, uh, I think, a better setup than that, really, where we get to know a couple people in her uh, her setting, like, you know, colleagues and, or, you know, classmates and uh, one of her teachers who she gets close to, uh, so that it's uh, not immediately jumping into the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but uh, it slowly encroaches on us. Uh, the uh, social work uh, field uh, is rife. I think this this time period, 2002-2003, is kind of an interesting time period for this to be set in, uh, partially because it was during the Intifada in Jerusalem especially, where uh, there were a lot of bombings, Every uh, a lot of Israeli citizens were on high alert because uh, there were so many uh, bombings in, uh, you know, what could be uh, uh, safe spaces, uh, and no longer were, like, you know, your bus terminals and so forth. Uh, so, so there's that. Uh, also, I think it's a time period when um, our sort of language of, uh, in the, in the liberal leftist spaces about uh, oppression and marginalization we're, we're changing and how we talk about uh, different minority groups and oppressed groups. Uh, so that sort of stuff is coming up and we see it encroaching a little bit in terms of uh, how people of color are, descri are, are described and how they describe themselves, their peripheral characters in this book. And then uh, we come across the Israeli-Palestinian conflict where uh, 
the most amount of screen time, as it were, is uh, given to uh, the Palestinian cause and uh, roots of oppression from the Israeli government there. Uh, in so doing, it erases a lot of uh, Israeli concerns, especially at the time dealing with Intifada, but uh, just erases the Israeli and the Jewish narratives in the Middle East, which is something I've, as a person on the left, has been, have been struggling with a lot in terms of uh, intersectionality, another one of our new keywords, I guess. Uh, it looks into, you know, how your different parts of identity uh, intersect with one another, and uh, it looks into uh, sort of the needs of marginalized groups, but uh, there's also this sort of hierarchy of uh, oppression that uh, has uh, cropped up a bit and can uh, be uh, somewhat narrowing, and it often uh, takes Jews and uh, our considerations for granted. Uh, so yeah, this is a book with a lot of those issues at play, it can lean into being a polemic, and unfortunately, I think that uh, Nora Gold, uh, her, this book was very polemic. We were way too much in Judith's head, uh, and she was really starting to see things in terms of, like, you know, are people for me or against me? Uh, and there was just all of this rambling narrative going on in her head as she was going into a lot of minutia about social work and those taxonomies and also about... Uh, the ways that uh, predominantly, very predominantly, uh, North American white uh, people with very little uh, background in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict had, took it on as a sort of war cry of, uh, you know, Palestinians are the angels and Israelis are the demons sort of thing. And, you know, there's just like, it's true, I mean, that I've seen as well that, you know, Israel has an outsized, um, representation in terms of evil governments uh, more, it gets more uh, talking time and screen time than any other uh, government with human rights uh, issues uh, but in terms of writing a novel uh, it was it was wearying it was tiring Judith is a character I think she came across could come across as uh, just overwhelming uh, the way that she couldn't see other people um, as more than how they related to her and her own issues. I think there's just something that this novel missed about the complexities of, uh, of human beings who, uh, you know, uh, interact with the Israeli-Palestinian movement. I mean, obviously, there is more going on in the lives of these classmates and colleagues than uh, just what they talk about or believe about Israel. Uh, so there's that. Uh, so uh, Judith could be pretty tiring. I think a couple of the plot points of uh, the novel got a little uh, over the top a bit, a little too much external drama going on for my taste uh, to sort of uh, continue to uh, keep Judith in a very fraught position. Uh, I mean, but I was incredibly invested because a lot of uh, the angst that Judith is dealing with is angst. I'm I've dealt with myself in the past uh, from my more limited perspective because I never have lived in Israel personally. Uh, and I do think two of the relationships that she has in here uh, were more compelling than I, uh, so, so I was happy with those, uh, particularly her relationship with a uh, professor that sort of uh, sours after time. And it's not, you know, overtly about this woman, you know, revealing herself to be an evil Jew hater or something. It's it's more subtle than that to a certain degree. I mean, it's exhausting because we're in Judith's head and she's constantly like, oh my God, is everything okay with this woman? Oh, does she love me? Does she hate me? What's going on? But, but, but beneath all of that, there's um, commentary in here about uh, academia that's more, uh, it's, it's, Bigger, it's broader than just the left and academia and sort of hypocrisy when it comes to how they talk about Israel. There's other issues about uh, academia, uh, party line towing, and uh, the ways professors can kind of fail their students sometimes or fail their own ideals, uh, and also uh, some more personal stuff that kind of crops up about this professor's life and her own flaws. So that, that I, I found that to be interesting. And I also found um, Judith's relationship with her boyfriend to be interesting uh, to a degree. I didn't know the backstory was a little wonky because they knew each other in high school and then they got back together like 10 years later uh, and 
a lot of the time I was kind of wondering what was keeping them together. Like, she didn't build up the nostalgia enough, I don't know, because otherwise they were sort of like on politically different tracks, as it were. Although, um, with Judith being much more liberal than her boyfriend Bobby, although Judith uh, was being tested by the uh, Canadian liberal establishment <laughs> because of... Uh, their differing opinions about Israel, there's that. But I think what was really the most interesting about her and Bobby is that uh, Judith always figured she'd go back to Israel right after this uh, graduate program, and Bobby was definitely going to stay in Canada, and yet they still loved each other, and it was sort of asking the question of, like, you know, what's a relationship like when you kind of like each you have these feelings for each other, but your own ambitions diverge a bit, and so... Uh, I, I thought she did that relatively well in terms of, um, I don't know, talking about the ways that uh, Judith and Bobby came together, but they also argued a lot. And and uh, also, yeah, it was kind of nice to see them come together, you know, even though they have differing opinions, they were able to find common ground. And frankly, I wish Gold had done more of that with regards to Judith and uh, her fellow leftists and liberals, especially with a a Jewish leftist group that, you know, came into the picture very briefly and I think should have been a bigger part. I don't know. I think, you know, it's sort of a thing where, you know, the ideas of it uh, I identified with a lot, but as a novel, uh, it was too polemic. It wasn't all the way there. <sighs> the next book I read this week was Mud, the first in the Chronicles of the Third Realm War by E.J. Wenstrom. This is the book I chose from my last video, the page 112 tag, uh, wherein I pitted three random books off my shelves against each other and read page 112 from them, and then chose this one. Uh, although, to be honest, I chose this one more because it's science fiction fantasy, uh, more than the tag itself, I guess, to be honest, I gotta say, because I had it in my head that I really want to read more science fiction and fantasy, and I hadn't read any yet this year. Um, I called it sci-fi uh, throughout my page 112 video, which I'll link down below, although technically this is fantasy. <laughs> this is also um, a lesser well-known book uh, because it doesn't come from a major press. This comes from a small to medium-sized press, City Owl Press, which publishes speculative and romantic and speculative romantic fiction, <laughs> and I will link their uh, page down below. I met Winstrom um, at the Maryland Writers Association Conference uh, in 2019, when you know we could meet in person. <laughs> uh, and she was giving a uh, talk on world building, and I got intrigued by the idea of her uh, series. Uh, the last book came out last year. Uh, and then I ended up uh, winning this one. Uh, she was doing a promotion for that last book last year and did a Goodreads giveaway for book one, which I won, and she even signed it for me, which was pretty awesome. Uh, so yeah, anyway, to get into the book, uh, I did like the world building a fair bit. Uh, it takes place in a kind of post-apocalyptic, uh, other world, kind of based on Earth, kinda, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh it takes place uh, in this, uh, world called Tarath, which is largely wasteland, or so they think, in the city of Ipo, which is a authoritarian, uh, state city, uh, where, um, the main characters have to escape from. Um, our main character is a golem called Adam, who was created by humans to protect this box. He knows very little about it, but for centuries, hunters have been coming to try to take the box from him, but whenever they touch it, he's sort of supernaturally compelled to kill them. And uh, he has a lot of angst about that situation. He doesn't want to be this soulless, immortal creature who is bound to kill people for reasons he doesn't understand. What he wants is a soul. Uh, and a chance to be human, and luckily he kind of gets that opportunity when he is approached by an angel uh, who uh, wants him to go into the underworld and retrieve um, his long-lost love. Uh, back several, you know, I guess hundreds of thousands of years ago, angels and humans were able to sort of live uh, in Taroth together, but then the gods kind of called the angels back to them, and... Uh, one of these angels apparently didn't like it so much, he wanted to be with his lady love, who ended up uh, killing herself out of despair, so he said. Uh, and he sends Adam into the underworld because Adam doesn't have a soul, so, you know, presumably he can make it in and out really uh, e more easily. <laughs> uh, 
On top of that, Adam meets up with uh, this young kind of messianic boy and his sister uh, and uh, feels this deep connection, especially to the boy Jordan, to keep him safe. So first he drops Jordan off at this Haven uh, village called Haven uh, in the section I actually read in page 112 before he goes on his journey to the underworld where of course things are a lot more complicated than Adam believes and he's part of a much bigger plot with regards to these realm wars that have been going on. Uh, we've had two so far. The gods have so far then abandoned humans to their fate, so it seems, to this post-apocalyptic world, but they might still be around and there might still be supernatural battling with, you know, Adam and Jordan, I guess, at the center. Uh, but that stuff is kind of more set up for book two. Book one is mostly about Adam's journey into the underworld and the people he meets there and sort of teasing the, the bigger implications of what's going on. Uh, so yeah, I like the world building. There's definite influences both from like Greek myths like Orpheus and also a lot from Judaism and Christianity, from golems to uh, the uh, relationships, I guess, between angels and God and that sort of stuff. Uh, I do think that in terms of character development, I wasn't as impressed. I, I was kind of uh, disappointed, in fact. I mean, I think Adam was well-defined. You know, his angst about who he is and what he wants were in his head. I thought that worked. But the rest of the relationships I, I didn't feel much for. I You know, reading page 112, I thought I'd feel a lot more for him and Jordan, but I didn't. I just feel like, you know, we were so involved in the plot and the world building even uh, could be so, like, exposition heavy that I never really felt like I was being drawn in by the characters and their relationships, which was unfortunate. It was propulsive because, you know, of all of these other issues, like, you know, you know, the plot, like what's going to happen next, and I kind of like the world building, but I never really fell for the characters, and uh, I am a character-driven sort of person, <laughs> so I feel like at the end of the day, you know, I'm glad I read it. Uh, I think in terms of a fantasy novel, it's kind of middle of the road then. Like, yeah, I like some of those aspects, but it really didn't transcend anything for me because I don't think... Uh, the characters uh, just uh, didn't really do much for me, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, still grateful that I uh, gave this a chance. I always want to support smaller presses and authors therein, and especially, you know, local folks, so huzzah. And next on the docket, I'm going to be reading The Explanation for Everything by Laura Grodstein. This is another book that uh, has been on my Goodreads uh, since 2016, so I am putting it on my To Read Now list. It has Jewish themes as well. This is my third Jewish-themed book and final Jewish-themed book of January. Uh, and I will read from the flap. There is nothing inherently threatening about Melissa, a young evangelist hoping to write the definitive paper on intelligent design. But when she implores Andy Waite, a biology professor and hardcore evolutionist, to direct her independent study, she becomes the catalyst for the collapsing house of cards surrounding him. As he works with Melissa, Andy finds that everything about his world is starting to add up differently. Suddenly, there is the possibility of faith. But with it comes responsibility and guilt, the very things Andy has sidestepped for years. Professor Waite is nearing the moment when his life might settle down a bit. Tenure is in sight, his daughters are starting to grow up, and he's slowly but surely healing from the sudden loss of his wife. His life is starting to make sense again, until the scientific stance that has defined his life and work is challenged by this charismatic student. In a bravura performance, Laura Grodstein dissects the preamble line between faith and doubt to create a fiercely intelligent story about the lives we tell ourselves, the deceptions we sustain with others, and how violated boundaries between students, teachers, believers, and non-believers can have devastating consequences. So yeah, kind of going back uh, with uh, Fields of Exile, this is another book about uh, faith and academia. I believe Waite has a Jewish uh, background, that's why it was on my Jewish Book Council list of books to read. Uh, once again, though, there's tension in the air between people of different belief systems. Uh, I think Grodstein's going to have a lot to sell if she's going to sell intelligent design as a good idea. <laughs> I don't know, this might be another one where hopefully 
again, the characters will be, you know, what as long as the characters are, you know, believable, that's my thing with fiction, no matter what they believe in. <laughs> so we will see, and uh, I will report back, uh, probably not in another video, but certainly in my uh, literary newsletter. Because this is my final AM reading video for January, uh, that about covers it for me now. <laughs> I will be back uh, pretty soon. I believe my next video, what I'll be doing is talking about the BookTube Prize, because I'm so, so excited. The uh, official long list will be announced on Monday. I am pretty sure that I will be called up to be a nonfiction judge. I'm really hoping I will be. Uh, you know, we need a lot of judges for the first round, and nonfiction isn't as popular as fiction, so uh, that's what I'm hoping for, and I'll be able to give my thoughts on the round I'm judging. But if I'm not called up to be a judge, I might just go ahead and do a booktube prize post uh, video anyway, and just talk about the long list or whatever, so stay tuned. But in the meantime, I am almost entirely out of battery here, just hoping everything's still filming and I'm gonna go. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching, everyone, and I'll see you next time.